morning, Father's house. Are y'all blessed this morning? Amen. How many men of God we got out there this morning? Men of God, women of God. Amen. We're in a pointed place this morning where God has set you here. You're not here by accident. You're here with his purpose on purpose this morning. Amen. Go put your hands together this morning. My feet gives way and I hear the sound of crashing waves. All my world is a washing out to sea. I'm hidden safe in the God who never moves, holding fast to the promise of your truth that you are holding tighter still to me. The rock won't move and 
and his word is strong. The rock won't move and his love can't be undone. The rock won't move and his word is strong. The rock won't move and his love can't be undone. The rock of our salvation. support within the raging flood even in the tempest I can sing I'm hidden safe in the God who never moves holding fast to the promise of your truth that you are holding tighter still to me the rock won't move and his word is strong the rock won't move Love can't be undone. The rock won't move and his word is strong. The rock won't move and his love can't be undone. The rock of our
stepping out in faith so the world would know your name. Christ alone be praised. No matter what it takes for the glory of your name, Christ alone be praised. We're stepping out in faith so the world would know your name. Christ alone be praised. No matter what it takes for the glory of your name, Christ alone be praised. We're stepping out in faith so the world will know your name. Christ alone be Father, we thank you that you make a difference in our life, that you can make the crooked path straight, you can show us the way, you've been there before us, you make a way for us, and I thank you that we're not left to our own devices, but that you lead, guide, and direct us. I got stuck on one of those lines in that song. No matter what it takes. No matter what it takes. Are we willing to do no matter what it takes to be fully devoted? I'm not bringing condemnation. I'm listening to the Holy Spirit who wants to show us some things, maybe a little conviction in our hearts, me included. No matter what it takes to be fully devoted, some of us have to give some things up. And some of us have to start doing some things that God has asked us to do. And, and, but he's, he loves us, so it's not going to hurt us. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. So, Father, I come before you right now, Lord, and ask you, God, to gently whisper whatever that is to each and every one of us, things we need to stop doing and things we need to start doing, whatever it takes to be fully devoted. Let not the, the, the lies of the enemy crowd out our minds or the words of our friends or family affect us in our decisions. So this morning, I pray for each one that's here today, Lord God, that they could be strong in their witness to you, Father strong in their decisions to follow after you strong Lord God in the things that you've asked us to do so that we can be fully devoted and be a light that shines and people are attracted to that light and they ask what does that mean what well, how are you living your life how are you following what are you doing and then we get to share the saving grace of Jesus Christ we get to share eternity in heaven forever with God so I thank you God that we're a company of people that are excited about being fully devoted. And we just don't come together to hear a, a good sound or listen to a good message, but we come to get 
united in heart and spirit and to get um, uh, just on fire for what you want to do with us when we leave this place so that we can glorify you, Lord, so we know how to love you more, so we can help people and we can build your kingdom, God. I thank you for these people that have come out this morning. I thank you for those that are online watching, God. Continue to speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ Shout of praise this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo! As you're seated this morning, go ahead and say hello to those around you. Find somebody you don't know and tell them, hey, Jesus loves you. Great to see you this morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us online. We have people joining us online every Sunday, and the experience is getting better and better because of our new equipment. And uh, we're just so thankful that you've joined us today. And anytime you're in this area, we'd love for you to come and be with us. Father's House, would you welcome those that are online this morning? Amen. It's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Man, last night or yesterday afternoon, we had a great time, and we had 67 men. I lost count after that, but we had 67 men at the Real Men event. If you were at with us yesterday, would you stand? I'd like you to see part of these 67 men that were with us yesterday. Look at this. Look at this. All around today. Wow. Wow. It was so great, and next year we'll be doing that again, and it'll be at the UCF Arena next year. We've got to have some more room, and we're just so thankful that real men decided to go to a Better Man conference and invest, and I don't think we any of us felt like that it uh, was a worthless time, but it was really great. Lonnie actually rode the mechanical bull, didn't fall off, Al didn't fall off, and Ben and I didn't try it, uh, you know, so... Uh, we had people ring the bell. We had a good, good time, and we appreciate the opportunity to do that. Let me just say this. Uh, the, the, our, our, our growth track will be in the second service today. So if you came and you've never been to the growth track, today is a brand-new series we're starting, 
and we've got the new books and everything, so I would encourage you, uh, if you haven't been through Growth Track, after this service is over, go to the Impact Center next door at 11 o'clock and get involved in the Growth Track. The Growth Track is designed to help you connect with the Father's house and to make a difference with your life. I think we all want to make a difference with our life. Let me say, um, uh, coming up is um, our leadership training on the 11th, which I think is probably next Sunday night, right? And at uh, 5 to 7 o'clock, we'll serve you food. You need to go online and register or let somebody know out on the uh, information thing today. I'll be teaching some uh, leadership principles, uh, and it's a great opportunity. I really encourage you to come. Daylight savings time coming that next Sunday, too. That's awesome. We get to lose an hour. Aren't you thankful for that? All right. And this Wednesday is First Wednesday. That's always a great time. I got a fresh word I want to share. We do um, communion together, the Lord's Supper, and that's 7 o'clock, so let me encourage you to be part of that. Also, uh, for those of you today that came in, all of us, we fill out one of these every Sunday. It's a connection card. And there's one in the chair in front of you, so would you take just a few minutes to fill that out, especially if you're a first-time guest, because I want to invite you to a house party. We had our first house party last week, and it was a party. It was great and awesome. So if you're a first-time guest, you're going to get an invitation to come to our next house party, which is coming up soon, and we'll send you some information about that because we want you to come. It's a less than an hour. And we feed you. We have the best nacho bar. It's, it's like a nacho bar out of this world on steroids. You've never had nachos like this. In fact, when you leave, you say, nacho, nacho, nacho. Man, this is a, this is a great place. You know, nacho is Hebrew for the presence of God. So uh, <laughs> not really. Don't check that out, uh, whatever you do. Also, we have coming up our uh, volunteer appreciation banquet that we have. Uh, we call that Team TFH Celebration. You have to be sure you register if you've uh, served anywhere last year. So you need to let somebody know because it's going to be great. We've got a jazz band coming. We've got a food. It's going to be unbelievable. A dessert bar. Man, I can hardly wait. It's going to be really great because we are thankful for those of you who serve at the Father's house. Well, we're getting ready to get into our notes uh, today. And if you want to turn to Luke chapter 15, and if you didn't get your study notes today, if you'll raise your hand, the ushers will be happy to give you one because there's, uh, there's a real neat thing on the back of this today of how to share your history. So if you didn't get one, do that. You have your Bible? Have your Bible on your smartphone, however you carry that. Let's raise it up and let's make this confession today. You ready? This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It is life to me. Today I receive the word. I confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I am obedient, and I will never be the same again in Jesus' name. Father, we come to you today. We love you. Wow. And we're so thankful as we move into your word. Wow, what a great time of worship and song. And now as we worship you, as we get into your word, and as we respond individually of how that you're speaking to us, I pray today that we'll leave today experiencing your presence, and you will draw us all closer to you in the precious name of Jesus, amen. Well, we're in a series, we're ending out today <clears throat> called Fully Devoted. We decided uh, five weeks ago we were going to do this as a challenge. So uh, we've been looking at a lot of things, and this was our theme verse. It was Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. It's there in your notes. Uh, and so uh, just follow along with me there in your notes. They devoted themselves to the apostle teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had anyone who had a need. Every day in the courts, they broke bread. God and enjoying the favor of all the people, read the last line with me, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. When I look at that passage, I'm thinking, I think we all as believers would want to see those things happening in our life, that the Lord would add daily those that were being saved. I, I'm so thankful here at the Father's house that almost every week in vision for Jesus Christ. I don't take that lightly. Do, do you appreciate that, that, that we're seeing lives? Yeah, let's give the Lord a hand clap. That, that doesn't happen. 
That doesn't happen in a lot of places. So when I look in Acts and I see how they changed their world, they had favor in their community. I mean, even heathens liked them. Uh, may not agree with them, but they liked them. There was, that's why we exist, voted followers of Christ. I, I'm not fully devoted. I don't think I'll ever be fully devoted till I get to heaven, but I'm working on it. And, and I know you're working on it, and I see it in you, and I think you're more devoted to him today. Now, we can't get more saved. Once you're saved, you're saved, right? You can't get more of Jesus. And Jesus comes in, you can't. But there's time that we surrender more of our life to him, right? And, and so that's what I see in you as we're becoming fully devoted. So I said, in, the, in this book here in Acts chapter 2, there were five different things, ingredients, uh, characteristics, uh, uh, things in their life that we can pick out and say, these five things help them to become a fully devoted follower. So I said, it's sort of like my famous uh, red velvet, delicious, moist cake. They say, wow, I'd like to have a cake that looks like that. So to have a cake that looks like that, I look at the back, and I look at the ingredients, and I say, okay, it takes some eggs and oil and some water and beat them together, and, and there's a, there's a coffee, cough drop in there. That sort of adds. Now, see, if I added a cough drop to this, I would mess up the recipe, right? So we, we want to take that. And so it is in life, if we try to add more to that, or if we take away, then we're not going to get that. So when I look at this book of Acts, I, I, in the beginning of this series, I said, Lord, show me what it was. Show me the things in their life that made a difference, that they were like a magnetism that drew people to you. And so we said in the very first week, they did authentic community. Say that with me. They cultivated authentic community. We have around here small groups and serving groups where somebody knows your name and, uh, and, and you can be known. You say, well, I'm introverted. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Just get connected. Just, can, just get can. We live in a world today when you hear this phrase, well, just be yourself. That's the most stupid phrase I've ever heard in my entire life. What if you're dumb? What if you're arrogant? What if you're negative? What if you're critical? You don't want to be yourself. You want to change. And we change when we connect with other people that can encourage us to change. How many of you are glad you're part of a small group or part of a serving group where somebody encourages you to change? It's not good to be alone. That's what Jesus said, and I'm not going to argue with him, right? It could be that God has some great plans for you, and he's going to work those plans through people that you don't even know now. It could be for some of you, the answer that you've been praying for was in a small group or a serving group. You would meet somebody there that might know somebody else that might open the door that might change your life. So the second week, we said we want to commit to a lifestyle of worship. It's not just in singing or clapping our hands, but it's in everything we do. We're reflecting back the creator, the maker who made us. The third week, we said we want to be intentional about growth. Nobody grows muscles by being unintentional. We grow fat bellies by being unintentional, right? We just go through life. But somebody says, you know, I'm going to do something about my life. I want to, I, I want to, I want to get in better shape. I, I want to go back to school. I want, it just doesn't happen automatically. We have to be intentional. And I don't care how spiritual you are this morning, unless you're intentional about getting into this word and intentional about communicating and talking to the Father, you're, you're not going to grow. You're going to just plateau in life. So if you missed that week, you want to get that. And then last, last week, we talked about faithfully managing the master's resources. We said the Lord has put resources in our hands, time, treasure, and talent. He's put those in us, and he is going to hold us accountable for how we use those. So look at your neighbor and say, how you doing? Are you faithful this week? If they look down and they said no, just say, well, be encouraged. You haven't died yet. So let's start today, all right? And so when I look at this, it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. How do you suppose that happened? How do you think it happened that in the early church that daily uh, they were being added to the church? Do you suppose that just happened accidentally? I don't believe that. 
I believe there was a magnetism by that early church. I believe when people saw their unity, that, that religion wouldn't allow women to come in and worship. But the church did, because that's God's way. And, and uh, religion wouldn't let Jews and Gentiles worship together. They wouldn't let Democrats and Republicans come together. And independents, uh, there was no place for that. But the early church did. There was something different about the unity that they had. It wasn't just their words, but it was their action. There was, there was something about the magnetism of their devotion. They were fully devoted. There was something about the magnetism that they had a passion for what God values the most, and that's people. Say people. Barna said, in his, one of his research, the lost people are not out looking for a church to attend today. The early church wouldn't have grown had those fully devoted members have not gone to their friends and experienced this. Change your life. We're not looking out, looking through the paper of what church can I go to. Well, we've got to go out and we've got to bring people. Listen, dying churches have a sign on the window and on their marquee. Let me tell you what it is. Come and join us. Everybody's welcome. That is a sign of a dying church. It's simply saying, if you will take the initiative and come and find us, everything will be wonderful. No, I think Jesus says, I want you to go. I want you to go to your friends. I want you to tell people that you meet. I want you to bring them in. You see, people are not drawn in by signs. They're not drawn in by brochures, but they're drawn in by people who show care and reach out to them. So today, I want to talk about outreach. And the title of today's teaching is simply this, Lost and Found, Reaching Out to the World Around Us. So are you uh, in your Bible at Luke chapter 15? Luke chapter 15, there are three parables, and, and these three parables teach us why reaching out to people is so important to Jesus. Sometimes we pray this prayer, oh Jesus, I just want to please you. I just want to please you more than anything else. I want to surrender my life to you. Then in these three parables, he tells us how to do that. He tells us how to do that. It's not by crying more. It's not by beating yourself up more. But it's by being intentional about reaching people that are in your world. You see, you can reach people in your world that I can't reach in my world. Uh, that's why I hardly ever tell people, and they say, what do you do for a living? I'm always careful not to immediately say to them, well, I'm a pastor of church. Because as soon as I say that, sometimes the wall goes up. So I say some creative things like, well, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> that always gets them. And, and sometimes I'll lead into a conversation before I get, and then sometimes I'll think, they need to be really shocked. So I got all, all my Harley gear, my leathers, and five rings, and I just simply say, yeah, I pastor a dangerous church. You ought to come and hang out with us. It's different. It's alive. It's dangerous. It's vibrant. Amen? So here we go. Let's read this. So I'm going to read the first one. The first parable is um, the parable of the lost sheep. Chapter 15. You got your Bible? Verses 1 through 10. Now the tax collectors and the sinners... We're all gathering around to hear him. <laughs> Where was the church? The Christians, I wonder, there. Yeah, okay. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. When's the last time you took a sinner to dinner? Then Jesus... And Jesus told them this parable. These, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he what? Finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. I tell you in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. 
So here's number five that we're going to look at today, the fifth ingredient. Here it is. Reach out to the world around us. Reach out to the world around us. Reach out to the world around us. Notice it says the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathered around Jesus. You know, one thing about Jesus, you'll find that he was always inclusive and not exclusive. So we have a first-time guest coming in. Oh, hi. Welcome to Father's house. What do you do? Oh, I'm an exotic dancer in Orlando at one of the strip clubs. Oh, it's great to have you today. Let me introduce you to Sue. Hey, in fact, why don't you sit with us? We always sit right over here. Or what, what you know? But no, so many times we say, oh, man, that person's a really sinner. Excuse me? Why do we exist? Why do we exist? Jesus didn't condone sinful behavior, but he loved people. He loved people because he was their creator. He was their maker. I, I, this thing of us drawing walls about who we're going to really be warm to and who we're going to be kind to, well, we've got to look at this and, and think, if I want to be more like Jesus, I've got to be more inclusive in my love. I, I still draw a line in the sand. I say, I'm sorry, I love you, but this is what the Bible says about your lifestyle, and I'm going to love you with everything that I have. I'm going to pray the Holy Spirit wakes you up. I'm going to pray the Holy Spirit brings you into a place that you align with the Word of God, but I will not rebel. I will not push you away because of your lifestyle or your actions. If you're thankful that somebody did that for you, would you give the Lord a hand clap? And Jesus told them this parable. And he says, a shepherd lost his sheep. Now, to our, our Western mind, that doesn't mean. But to the Eastern culture, he's really addressing. Literally in Greek, it reads, which of you being a shepherd of a hundred sheep and loses one of them? In the Mideastern culture, it was always save face. And they were important about save face. And so if Jesus would have asked this question, how many of you have ever lost one of your sheep? Their immediate response would be to save face. Oh, I never lost one. I never lost one in my whole life. Now, they may have wandered off, but none of us have ever lost a sheep. But he said a shepherd had 99 sheep. And one, he had 100 sheep, and one walked away. And he says he leaves the 99. It doesn't say he took them back and put them in the fence and made sure somebody took care of them. It doesn't say that he said to another shepherd, will you watch my 99 while, while I'm going to go find the one that was lost? It says he left the 99 and he went searching for one. 99, one. Now when I read that, I say, that's pretty irresponsible. Come on. Read the Bible. Get out of your little cultural things that we look oh that's wonderful he took it no he left them alone he left them alone to the wolves to everything else you say well that is responsible that that just no no it's not especially if you're the one that's not irresponsible how many of you say, I thank God that he found me where I was? Yeah. So he says, look, he said, when you find that sheep, he said, I put it on my shoulders. And he said, I said to my friends, rejoice with me. I found what I lost. The second story is another hypothetical story. And it starts off like this. Verse 8, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and she loses how many? Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, then she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. How many? How many? Again, it's safe face. How many of you that are women? It's kind of interesting that in a bunch of Pharisees, he's talking to women. Because, you know, in most churches, women have no rights. Isn't that silly? 
Isn't that silly when God created women and gave them a special place that people take two scriptures out of context and they try to make a whole doctrine out of that? It's not a, it's not a matter of biblical interpretation. It's a matter of personal application of the truth of all God's word into that. But Jesus was inclusive. He said, how many of you women would have lost a coin? And again, no, I wouldn't lose that. You see, they were an agrarian society, so they bartered for everything. Coins would have been used for emergency. And so the one woman uh, had 10 coins. That was probably her dowry. And so it was precious to her. And she lost a coin. And she moved everything around so that she could find that. And when she found it, she said, rejoice with me. She threw a party and she said, rejoice with me. I found the one lost coin. And again, Jesus says, just in case you want to know what I'm talking about, there's no more rejoicing in heaven except when one sinner makes that decision to change their life for Jesus. Doesn't that thrill you? Doesn't that thrill your heart? I mean, th to think about that. And then let's, let's look at the next one. It's a story of the prodigal son. It's rather long, so I won't just read through every bit of this, but I encourage you, as a story progresses, it's a story of a father, remember? A father in the Middle East culture like no other father before. And the story begins in, act in, act in actually in verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, again, to our mind, we say, okay, big deal, you know. But no, not to an Eastern ear, not to an Eastern culture. I, I mean, this was, this was really, really horrible. Uh, the, the prodigal son asked his father to divide the inheritance and give him what is his. Now, when you look at that through the Eastern culture, he, he says, it's like everybody says, I can't believe a son would ask that. In other words, here's what he was saying. I wish you were dead. Because if you were dead, I could get my inheritance, and I could get out of here, and I could do whatever I wanted to with what I had. I mean, it was a shock to those Eastern ears. How could anybody say that? How could anybody say to their father, I, I wish you were dead. Give me my inheritance. But what did the father do? He gave it to him. You see, some of you today have started out serving the Lord years ago, maybe even when you were a kid in church, and you got sidetracked by a lot of things. You thought you'd find something that would be more satisfying, and you spent all of that, and you're here today. You know why you're here today? It's not an accident that you came on this particular day because he wants you to know, you know, when you turned away and walked away from him, he didn't stand in the front of you and say, no, no, I'm not going to let you go. No, no, I'm going to stiff arm you. He said, if you don't want to be a fully devoted and follow after me, I'm going to let you go. But guess what? Every step that you've taken, he's been one step behind you. Every step you took, he was one step behind you. Every time you did drugs, he was there. Every time you found another prostitute, he was there. Every time you tried another addiction, he was there. He was there so much that his presence is here today. And he's saying, I've been looking for you this long. I wanted you to hear today of how much that I care for you. And it says, not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set out for a distant country, verse 13. It says, not long after that. In other words, he didn't leave immediately. Why didn't he leave immediately? Well, he had to sell off his inheritance. You got this many lambs, you got this many cows, you got this, you got this. So where's he selling that? He's selling that into the community, going door to door, knocking on people's door. Do you like to buy this? And the townspeople despised him. That's the parable that Jesus is saying. For what he's this kid is a rebellious kid. He's squandering the inheritance. He's squandering his time, his talent, and his treasury. I mean, it's like the most horrible thing they ever heard. So, I mean, you know, he goes and he begins to descend in his own personal hell. In verse 13, it says he squandered his wealth in wild living. He wasted it in plain sights of people that are around. And then he begged people for a job. The way you got rid of people that you didn't want around you, you gave them a job that nobody else would want. And they gave him a job of feeding the pigs. You had to feed the pigs seven days a week, so that means you couldn't have a Sabbath. You had to get out there and slop the pigs, which is a very unclean animal. 
And so there was nothing worse that you could do that. But in this hole of self-pity, he comes to himself and he says, man, I insulted my dad. I shamed him. I'm a failure. I really have nothing to offer. In the Mideastern culture, sons are supposed to provide for their fathers in their old age. Did you hear that, young people? You're to provide for your parents in their old age. Okay, all right. There was no Social Security. There was no Medicare. There was no retirement. There was nothing like that. But in that particular culture, a son was given an inheritance so that he could continue to help his parents to go ahead and exist. So he's lost everything. He's humiliated. He's broken. There's no way that I can come back to God. There's no way. I've gone too far. Anybody ever been there before? I've been, I've gone too far away. Yeah. So he devises a plan. I'll go home. I'll admit I was a fool. Instead of being asked to be reinstated as a son, I'll say, just hire me as a servant. You see, because he knows that he can't go home because there's a couple of problems. First of all, will my father accept me back? I mean, how do you spit in somebody's face and take everything that you should have had for a purpose and waste it. And then there's the villagers. He knows to get home, he's got to go through the villagers. And they could act, you see, you could actually be stoned in that culture for saying to a parent, dishonoring them, I wish you were dead. So, what about the father? Well, the father knows that his son was very immature and impulsive, and he's probably never be a successful businessman. Second thing, the father knows that he's got to come through the villagers. And since the young man left, that's all that the townspeople can talk about of how horrible that he was. And he knows that if his son ever does return, the first person that actually sees him will be be probably somebody from the village. And if he's not careful, everybody will get together and they'll stone him and they'll keep him out. Father knows this. So and in anticipation of his son returning, not if, but in an anticipation. Somebody I asked this morning, I said, hey, have you seen so-and-so? And they said, well, I think we've lost her. I said, oh, no, don't say that. We haven't lost her. Easter's coming. That's on April Fool's Day, you know. No fooling. In an anticipation, the father made a plan for the one that was lost. So so it's five things that five things that he does. The first thing is the father runs. When word comes to the village that his son is coming, the father hears it and he runs to him. This is an outrageous thing because men did not run in that culture. He picks up his, uh, his loose garment, he ties it up, and he, he runs. He wants to be the first one, verse 20. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. You see, that's the way the father felt. He was totally motivated by love. That's a picture of God, your father, this morning. He's he's looking in anticipation that today you're going to come home. He's looking. His heart is moved with compassion. And he says to us as a church, if you want to know my will for your life, if you want to know what my heart is, you need to begin developing a compassion for people around you that are lost and anticipate that they're going to come home to me one day. Oh, thank you, God. As a father runs to the village, he's creating a spectacle. He draws a crowd. He will be humiliated. He's the man in our community that humiliated himself to run towards a rebellious son that took everything from him. Jesus Christ is the one who left everything in heaven. He came and lived a sinless life, and he went to a cross. He took my sins and your sins so that we can have access back to God. That's Jesus that we serve, and if you serve him today, let's give him a hand clap. Thank you, God. Do we care enough to be humiliated if it takes that to see one person come shoulder to shoulder? You see, in his mind, the son had 
pictured himself of coming and abasing himself before, before his father. I'll, I'll kneel at his feet. I'll kiss his feet. I'll show him honor. And I'll say, just, just let me be a hired servant. But when the father sees him, he holds him so tight that the son can't get down. He can't earn his way into the father's love. He just has to accept the father's love, eyeball to eyeball, shoulder to shoulder, and he couldn't get down there like some of you are trying to earn your way back to Jesus. Well, I'll just humble myself. I'll just say these things about me. But no, you, you can't do that because he's going to hold you tight today. His plan, the son's plan was to admit his guilt and just say, I'm, but he couldn't do that. He couldn't kneel. His plan was to earn his way back into God's favor. But you can't earn your way back to him. Third thing the father did is he calls for a robe to be put on his son. Verse 22. He said, hurry, go. Bring the best robe. What, who, who do you think owned the best robe in the house? Who do you think owned the best robe? The father owned the best Armani suit that day. He said, go get my best one. Jesus clothes me in a robe of righteousness. Terry Lee Mahan has been accepted in the son's work on the cross. He became my sin. He who knew no sin so that I could be known as the righteous of God. Look at me. In God's eyesight today, I am just as righteous as Jesus Christ. Legally. Now, experientially, it might be a di little different. Don't ask my wife. All right? Don't ask Sean. He wouldn't carry my purse for me yesterday, all right? All right, we'll talk about that more later. <laughs> Finally, the fourth thing he says, put a ring on his hand, the sandals, put him back in total authority. And then verse 5, I love this. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. I, I was reading through that, and I, I felt the Lord say, why didn't I say bring the best chicken? Bring the best goat. Bring the best sheep. Why the fatted calf? Because the fatted calf had enough meat to invite the village people into the celebration. He wanted to restore his son, and he wanted people to rejoice with him every Sunday. Or every time you pray for someone and they surrender their heart to the Lord. I mean, we should, we should partake of that fatted calf and say, thank God, man, I'm rejoicing. This is going to be, this is so awesome. This is so, no one could have anticipated this story. Listen, I don't care who you are. If Jesus calls you his son or his daughter, you are my son, you are my brother, and you are my sister, regardless of your age, regardless of your race. We're not a family by what you do or say. We're all, so don't give me this relapse if you perform in a certain way. If his royal blood flows through you today, regardless of what you look like or who you are. Three stories. I was saying, in every one of us, missing matter. Sheep, the coin, the sun, matter to God. Yes. We're not keepers of the aquarium. We're fishers of men. Say, so, yeah, but people are really bad out there. Excuse me? Do you remember you, B B.C.? Do you remember you, B.C., before Christ? Have you forgotten so much? Has, he, has it been so long that you have forgotten what it was like to feel like you've lost everything and there was no hope, that you've abandoned everything, there was no purpose in your life, that you'd never find anybody that would care? Have you forgotten about that? No. We don't forget about that, right? The other son says, man, how could you treat him like that? You owe me. I didn't leave. 
See, you get nothing by God, by our actions, it's grace. Guess what? Easter's coming. Say it with me. Easter's coming. 25% of all guests in America that come to church, come to church on Easter Sunday. 25% of all guests that come to church, come to church on Christmas. That means the other 50% of guests come sprinkled out through the 12 months of the year. Easter is a big fish day for us. How many of you have ever been to a fish store, had a good meal, sat down? Guess what? That fish did not swim upstream to that restaurant and lay itself down on the stove. Somebody went where the fish was, and they brought that fish back. They cleaned it after they caught it. Some of you are trying to clean people up before you get them to Jesus. Let Jesus clean them, all right? You just bring them. You bring them just the way they are. So to help everybody, we have these invite cards that we give out every year, and we do them again. And so come on, ushers, let's pass those buckets down the aisle. I'd like for you to take out three cards. So they're Easter invite cards. I think they're the best ones we've ever had. Catherine, would you give me one of those? I think they're the really prettiest that we've ever had. Look at that. It just says Easter, April 1. I want you to take three, one for the lost coin, one for the lost sheep, and one for the lost son. And I want you to pray about who you can use this to invite somebody to, to church on Easter Sunday. I want you to invite them. They say, you know, and I know some of you, the whole, the whole culture we live in to world today because there's such a dividing line. Uh, some of you will say, uh, some people say, a friend of mine told me the other day, he said, man, I couldn't believe this. Pastor told me, they just ripped me out and said, you, they were African American. They said, oh, you go to that white church? Well, what are you doing going to that white church? And he said, man, I was really humiliated. Look, we're not a white church. We're not a black church. We're not a Hispanic church. We're a church of a family. Now, I know. So, so I'm saying on Easter, let's go out of our way to make people feel at home. You see, it's one thing to hand out a brochure as people are walking in, and it's another thing about intentionally making them feel welcome. You ever been in any place where they invited you in, but they didn't make you feel welcome? You came in, you sat down by yourself, you know. I don't, some of you have never had the experience of going to another church that's traditionally different than you. You need to try it sometime. I've been to some of my African-American brother's church that I was the only white person there. I felt like the cream of an Oreo cookie, all right? I mean, that, that's how I felt. But I tell you, it was a little uncomfortable at first because I, what, what's, what am I expecting, what's going on? But I tell you what made a world of difference when somebody came across, introduced themselves, shook my hand, gave me a big hug, said, we're so glad to see you here today. That's what I'm going to challenge every one of us to do on Easter Sunday. I'm going to ask you to go out of your way, be the nicest that you have. I'm going to ask those of you, would you take out your connection card? I'm going to ask those of you who serve in any area on the back, I'm going to say there, I, I want you to put down there, and I'd like you to pray about this. I'll serve in both services on that Sunday. I'll double serve because I want to be sure everybody gets served well. Listen, I, if, if you've never parked a car, but you'd be willing to help us park cars because we'll be parking next door and all around, would you put on there, I'll help park cars for Easter, no fooling. Would you put that down there? I'll help that. In two services, I'll help that. Would you do that? Would you get out of your comfort zone? Would you think more about others than you think about yourself? Would you think of what it would be like for a single mom to come, and she's got three or four kids, and she pulls up over there, can't find a parking place anywhere because all of us regulars have parked out front? Some of you got two good legs, two good arms, and I think we need to start parking in the back making room for people in the front that we believe that God is going to send. Now, if we don't believe God's going to send anybody, any place, just be an older brother and take your place up front. But if we believe, let's, let's get out of our way and let's, let's do it. Would, would you do that? Could you, and would you, would you at least take that card and on that connection card, maybe there's somebody you're praying for, would you put their name on there? And would you, uh, would you join us on Saturday mornings as we pray for them? So just go ahead and put your name on there and say, you know what, I'll, I'll, serve, I'll serve in both services. And the second thing we're going to pick out of this is what's missing, warrants an intentional search. In each case, somebody that was lost, something that was lost. And then the third thing is restoration brings rejoicing. He's saying missing things, missing people matter enough to warrant intentional search. Find everybody who's missing and bring them to me. 
Why do we give you the invitation card? Why do we say use this this week? Because we have compassion for people. We remember what it was like to be lost and be found. We have a story on the back of your notes today is how to share your your history, your story with him. Can I encourage you to work on that? And here are the next steps for this week. Pray this eight-word prayer for the next eight days. Would you pray it with me? God, give me your heart for the lost. Second of all, prayerfully invest in and invite at least three people for Easter. And then share your his story with someone. Just do that. Anita and I were on a bus this week, and we had a little free getaway. And to be part of that, you had to go on those timeshare presentations. And we told the guy up front, you know, we're not going to buy. I came here for the free things, so I just want you to know that right now, okay? I'm just here for the freebies. I didn't call you. You called me, and you gave me all those things if I'd come. So I'm just, I'm here. So we're on a bus. That's not my favorite thing to do. So we're on a bus with a bunch of people going over there. There's a young couple sitting there, and uh, uh, we struck up conversation and uh, found out there were police officers from Tallahassee. Um, she was on patrol, and he was, um, um, I forgot what he was. He was a little higher ranked than she was. And so An- Anita begins to add value to them. Well, she's conversing with them. Oh, yeah. And, then, and they say, uh, what they said, uh, so we said, what do you do, police officers? And they said, look at uh, to us, uh, what do you do? And I had on uh, a leather jacket, my black shirt, you know, how I usually wear, even coming here, uh, untraditional. And we said, oh, we pastor a church. And it was a pause, like a 60-second, like, pause. And they said, really? And so Anita just weighs in to add value. You guys go to church somewhere in Tallahassee? Because Anita used to live there, so, you know, it's common ground. No, we really don't. We've, we used to, but we've gotten away from that. No, she doesn't stop. She just weighs on in. Shares a little, you know, my husband was raised Catholic. Oh, Anita says, oh, I was too. She just wades on in, adding value to them. Be a little drive for you to get to the Father's house, but you know what? You can watch us online. They may be watching today, and we say welcome if you are. So we got out. We went into the little thing, and then the guy comes over, and he has a piece of paper. Because I was looking everywhere for my invite cards. I didn't have one, okay? And he brought over a piece of paper, and he said, what was the name of your church again? We want to watch online. I believe every seed that we sow for this awesome Jesus that we serve, it's not about flicking you another invite card that you're going to stack in your ashtray or in your glove box and you never give it out. It's about caring enough about who Jesus cares about. Lost people who feel like nobody cares about them. And we're doing our best. I I see these empty seats, and my dream, Warren, is to see this building full three times on a Sunday or a weekend, whatever we do. If it's a Saturday night, I don't know. My dream is to see a building next door that would seat uh, over at least over a 1,000. Uh, my dream is to see that building full a couple of times. I, I just, I told somebody that day, I said, we got to build another building. There's another pastor in town. And he said, oh, that makes me tired. I just couldn't even think about trying to get in another building program. And I'm thinking, Lord, please don't let me get to that place. As long as there's one more lost person and we don't have room and we're maxed out. So I'm saying, would you join me in this? Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for caring for us and for loving us. Please, Lord, give us as a church your heart for the lost. As you continue to pray, I just, every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to take some time this morning. If you're here today and maybe you're one of those people that you are lost today. You feel like your marriage is lost. You feel like your focus is lost. 
you've been coming to church and you've been checking us out at a distance to see if we're really real. Now some people leave because I'm a little too real. But we just, we just say uh, really where we are. On Sundays when I stand up here, I feel like I'm standing in front of the gates of hell and people are driving at breakneck speed down a road and I'm flailing my arms and trying to redirect the flow of your life away from destruction back into the arms of a loving, caring Jesus who died on the cross for your sins. And my tears are unashamedly tears this morning. And they're tears of love and compassion. Because as long as there's one lost person or one person unsure of their destiny in this church, I'd be willing to do everything I can do today to see you make this decision back to Jesus. So would you let me pray with you today if that's you? If you'd say, Terry, I'm just not sure. Maybe I've wandered away from the Lord or today for the very first time I want to I want to invite Jesus into my life. I want to repent of my sins. Let him change my life. As this church is praying, would you raise your hands and make eye contact with me right now and say, Terry, that's me. That's me. I want to pray that prayer today. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Such honesty today. I'm, I'm choosing Jesus today. The devil just told somebody, oh, you better not raise your hand because you can't do it. That's probably one of the first times that he's really told the truth because you can't do it. It's because of Jesus. But I really feel like someone today has been listening to that lie that you can't do it. Would you go ahead and raise your hand and make eye contact with me and say, yeah, today I want to do it. I want to make that decision. I'm waiting for you. Waiting for you today. someday. No, you don't have someday, you have today. Please. Let's pray. Let's pray this prayer together. Father God, thank you today for loving me, for caring for me, for sending your son Jesus to live in this world, to die for my sins. I can't believe that you care that much for me. I repent of my sins and I ask you to be my Lord as best as I know how I'm going to live for you all the days of my life fill me with your spirit in your name Jesus those of you who raised your hand over here, here and back here and here and here and over here The ushers are coming at this time, and they have a little book that I'd like to give you. It's called Now What? It's just to help you uh, now that you've made a decision. Would you raise your hand again so they can give that to you? Come on, church. Let's celebrate this morning. Come on, church. Come on, church. Let's celebrate today. Let's celebrate today. Listen, those of you who prayed that prayer with me today, On this connection card, would you put on there, uh, uh, today I became a first-time follower of Jesus. And then would you check the box, baptism? We're going to baptize again um, in uh, February at the end of the the month. We'll do it at the uh, the, the, uh, fifth Sunday of whatever it is, fifth Sunday. It's, uh, we're past February, right? February is my birthday month. I just hate to let it go. It's like Christmas. I hate to let Christmas go, you know. You get older, I think I should have two birthday months. So I'm going to take February and March. I may take April, even though it's yours. I may take April too. Anyway, baptism. And would you get involved in our new believers class next door at 9 o'clock next week? It's, it's, it's life-changing. And then get into growth. Ushers, would you come? 
Let's just going to receive our tithe and offering. But before we do that, we're going to have a prayer. But let me encourage you. God is looking today to see how we uh, are manage what he's put into our hands. Again, with a connection card, those of you that are first-time guests, or if you've never filled out a card before, let me give you an invite to our house party. It's going to be really, really, really great. And again, if you, are, if you attend the Father's house, would you please consider serving extra on Easter Sunday? We thought about having a third service on Easter, but we said, let's add more chairs, roll the stage back in, and let's just pack it out, see how many people we can get in two services. Wouldn't that be a, a hoot? Wouldn't that be fun if we'd have to say, those of you that are regular people, come and set up on stage. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be wonderful on that day of a friend that you've been praying for would give their heart to the Lord and make that journey? Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. All right. Let's pray this prayer together, Lord. Receive our tithe and offerings as an expression of our love and obedience to you. We thank you, Lord. You are the provider of all things. According to your word in Malachi 3, we ask that you rebuke the devourer and open the windows of heaven, pouring out your overflowing blessings and expanding our borders with jobs, raises, commissions, bonuses, and benefits. We're believing you for sales, settlements, unexpected income, interest, inheritance, wise investments, and debts paid. As we honor your word, give us favor with man, give us wisdom and creativity to craft and invite what will benefit. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of our financial needs you have given us that we might give into your kingdom and to promote the truth of the gospel throughout the earth. Amen. Listen, don't leave yet. Let me release a blessing over you. Drop your tithe and offering in and saying, this is to you, Jesus. Don't forget, first Wednesday, Wednesday night. Um, prayer team will be down here to pray with you but let's sing a little more of this song and then I want to release a blessing over you you to somebody today to invite if you use it at a restaurant be sure you leave a great tip all right i bless you today in the name that is above all other names the name of the king of kings and the lord of lords the name of our soon coming jesus to restore peace on this earth that's so torn apart I release healing over you today. I release direction over you today. I release unusual favor that God opens doors this week, that you can love God with all your heart, that you can help people, and you can build the kingdom. Remember, as we go out of here today, we're going to give God everything that we have. If you're a first-time guest, I sure would like to meet you today. Thank you for coming. I love you guys. I bless you. I'll see you Wednesday night. Lord for meeting all of our financial needs you have given us that we might give into your kingdom and to promote the truth of the gospel throughout the earth amen listen don't leave yet let me release a blessing over you drop your tithe and offering in and saying this is to you Jesus don't forget first Wednesday Wednesday night um, a prayer team will be down here to pray with you but let's sing a little more of this song and then I want to release a blessing over you
got your invite cards, and I'm going to pray that God directs you to somebody today to invite. If you use it at a restaurant, be sure you leave a great tip. All right. I bless you today in the name that is above all other names. The name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The name of our soon coming Jesus to restore peace on this earth that's so torn apart. I release healing over you today. I release direction over you today. I release unusual favor that God opens doors this week, that you can love God with all your heart, that you can help people, and you can build the kingdom. Remember, as we go out of here today, we're going to give God everything that we have. If you're a first-time guest, I sure would like to meet you today. Thank you for coming. I love you guys. God bless you. I'll see you Wednesday night.